I just realized I grew up in a coal town. Fascinating. <laughs> How did I not know this? <laughs> People talk a lot about those places as being in like West Virginia you know, and Appalachia, and there are a lot of them, but there's a lot of them in the American West too. Well, in like my brother in law worked at the Arizona Public Service coal fired generating plant right up by Farmington for, I don't think it was 50 years, but let's see, he's, he's probably 40, 35, 40 years because he just retired a couple of years ago. And aside from the extractive industries, um, you know, his health is terrible. Yeah, the San Juan generating station in Farmington that closed. Yeah, that's the one. Didn't it? It closed on yeah. when did it close? Yes. It was retired in June. Co and that op yeah. that was commissioned. The very first unit opened in nineteen seventy three. Fifty years. Yeah. I'm just trying to provide concrete examples yeah. to give people the timeline of like what these kinds of projects actually entail. Yeah. 50 years max. Yep. And that provided, you know, a decent living for people living in, you know, that whole area, Fruitland, Kirtland, Shiprock, um, for 50 years. So two generations. Um, but it also severely impacted their health. I mean, I don't think it was a healthy place to work. And I guess like, um, I'm not like making a case against development for, you know, I, our people deserve to have, like, they need the resources to be able to have things like education and quality healthcare and housing and water infrastructure. Like, I'm not saying that I'm not an anti-development person. I used to be, <laughs> but I think now I'm not so much anti-development, but it's, you know, like you're your uh, philosophy and your practice of development has to have like a very strong politics of um, that places like the well-being of the people and the well-being of the earth um, at the the center. That it just has to, because otherwise, like we're all just going to die by twenty fifty. <laughs> that's a climate change, and that and that's a very indigenous um, perspective on things. That's why, you know, that's why the the any development that takes place. Um, on Indian land, and yes, it's all Indian land, needs to be, it needs to be approached with an indigenous, you know, worldview, an indigenous cosmology. And um, there are, uh, there are industries, there are ways of creating economic development on our lands that um, will not harm our lands. It's just not the fast and easy and cheap way to do things, which is what capitalism wants. Capitalism wants instant rewards. And, um, you know, that, that, that's not going to happen. Um, you need to have these, these, we've talked about these before too, just transitions from these destructive industries to industries that can be long-term and that can be beneficial and that don't harm well, the environment. Well, the BNV year, right? Like the, um, Pachamama Accords from 2011, we talk about this a lot. Um, I think what is kind of being termed as eco-socialism and, you know, that milieu or whatever that does actually provide is like the, like an indigenous cosmovision is the basis for that interpretation of development. Um, it is not an anti-development interpretation, but it is an indigenous um, centered, it, the origin of that approach to development comes from indigenous philosophy and indigenous worldview um, as well as socialism, right? A certain also political orientation that's very much oriented towards the public good, right? Towards creating the greatest, um, the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people, including the earth. So there are like, act th and there's actually countries like Bolivia who are actually trying to like implement this style of development. So it's not like these things don't exist in the world. So um, anyway, I wish like maybe our tribal leaders would go to those gatherings, <laughs> you know? Just like have the bravery um, to implement that stuff.